There's three reasons why I see people's best intentions typically fail when it comes to setting goals or trying to change things. The first is that we just don't have enough time, or in some cases, we don't have enough energy to follow through on the changes we've decided to try to implement. The second is we forget about the things we were trying to do. We make commitments to ourselves. We read a book or see a YouTube video and get really hyped up about some change and say, I'm going to do it. And then within a few hours, maybe a few days, best case scenario, that idea just didn't really stick in our minds. And and we fall back on it. Or the third reason is we don't totally understand why something works. I think a lot of the times we we hear these like bullet point lists of like, here's a whole bunch of stuff you should be doing, but there's not a lot of depth to it. There's not a lot of explanation for how these interventions work or what exactly they're going to do for you. We just hear this general, like we're supposed to be doing these things. And that often doesn't give us enough motivation or enough interest or enough value in that idea to make it something that we can follow through on. Today, I'm going to problem solve all three of those things for you, and I'm going to give you 13 concrete strategies that if you follow in 2024, your mental health will be transformed. Now, I know that's a little bit of a bold claim, and I'm a realist, so I'm going to say, I don't know what your life is going to be like in 2024. I don't know what's going to happen to you. I don't know what events are going to befall you. I'm not saying that these things will fix your life and fix your mental health no matter what happens to you. I'm saying they will put you in the best position to have 2024 be a good year for you mental health wise. There's always random chance. There's always things that happen beyond our control. Nothing I can teach you is gonna change that, but that's really what a lot of this is about. It's not about promises. It's not about guarantees. It's about putting yourself in the best situation to have the best odds to survive the randomness of the world. And that's what we're going to cover today. I'm even going to give you a bonus one to start out with. But before I do that, there's just one thing really quick that I want you to notice was not one of the three reasons that we don't typically follow through on things. And it was that we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. In other words, I said that in a weird double negative kind of way. So let me explain. A lot of people, I don't mean for this to sound judgmental, end up in these patterns of endless information seeking where they're they're reading all these books and they're consuming all these all this content on on social media and they're trying to gather all of this information about what should i do to to be a better person or to be happier or to better manage this condition that i have and you get to the point where it's complete and total information overload you have so many ideas for what you could be implementing, that it actually becomes a bottleneck. It actually becomes a barrier and you don't end up trying any of them. And you notice I'm not doing anything and therefore I'm not getting any better. And you keep seeking out more and more information. At some point, you have to turn that information into action. Learning, learning is important. Don't get me wrong. But I do sometimes see people use learning as sort of a way to fake working on something without actually doing it. And I don't think we're always doing this to try to fool other people. I think sometimes we do it to try to fool ourselves because we're scared to actually take action. And when we're learning about something that's related to our lives or ourselves or our condition, it can make us feel like we're working. But be honest with yourself. Are you really in a position where adding more knowledge is the thing you need. We're not knowing what to do is your biggest barrier or is your biggest barrier taking what you already know and putting it into action. The reason I point that out is I doubt that I'm going to say anything that you've never heard today. Unless this is like the first video on mental health that you've ever watched. A lot of this is going to be like, oh, I've heard that before. But have you tried it? Have you, using the strategies I articulate today, really put these idea ideas together in an actionable, cohesive lifestyle plan? I'm betting that for most of you, the answer is no. And if you do that, it can make all the difference in the world. So the bonus, the plus one of the 13 things to, to do to fix your mental health in 2024 is be very careful who you listen to, because a lot of the advice out there, if you look a little bit closer, if you look behind the person who's saying it, you can clearly see it's not meant for you. I, I'm not even necessarily talking about the people who like rent giant houses and yachts to try to make you think they're happy and famous. I'm talking about the people who say things that probably are technically correct and, and have some validity and some research behind them, but their ideas are unfeasible for your lifestyle. For example, if someone tells you the way to get ahead is by working 16 hours a day, I mean, that's, that's probably true. If you actually worked 16 hours a day, you would probably be amazing at what you do. 
But the person telling you to do that might not have a family, right? And if you have a partner and you have children, then that's terrible advice for you because you have more to do with your life than just working. Or if someone tells you that you should try to get outside every single day, no matter what, and they live in Los Angeles and you live in Pennsylvania, well, there's large periods of time where it's really probably not a great idea for you to go outside because the weather is miserable, possibly even dangerous. If someone tells you that they have a four hour morning routine that involves stretching and meditation and reading, and they are a professional YouTuber who only has to work 12 hours a week to make more money than you do, then their life is not really meant for you who has a nine to five and a family and, and everything else, right? So just... Make sure you know where it's coming from before you try to apply it to your life. With that being said, let me briefly introduce myself with a little more detail than I usually do. I'm Dr. Scott, a licensed clinical psychologist. I am also a family man. I am married. I have two kids. They are relatively young, ages seven and 10. I have a regular nine to five job, and it is not this. This is a side gig. I work full time as a licensed clinical psychologist, so I probably have a pretty similar work schedule to most of you. I live in the suburbs, in the Midwest, in Iowa. So if that sounds somewhat similar, similar to your life, then there's a decent chance that what I have to say to you is actually going to be applicable to your life and something you can actually implement in a functional, non-pipe dream kind of way. I hope that makes sense. So I'm going to separate these into three categories. And the first category is interventions that are going to increase the amount of time and energy you have. Because again, that's typically the biggest barrier. We don't have time to add new things to our lives. Our lives are already full, right? And so when we try to add something to a life that's already full, eventually it just gets squeezed out by all the other responsibilities and obligations we already have. I, I'll just start with this. I'll start with the thing. This is, I'm leading with this one because I think it's the most important. I also think it's the hardest. In fact, I'm, I'm almost certain that this is the hardest. But if you only did this and shut the video off after this one and ignored everything else I said, I think you would have a massive improvement in 2024. The first thing I want you to consider doing is do not pick up your phone unless you have a specific reason for doing so. And if you do pick up your phone because you have a specific reason for doing so, Put it down when you have completed the task that you picked it up for. It is far too easy to lose hours and hours of our day to doing nothing on your phone. Most people under most circumstances are actually not very willing to do nothing because it's very boring and very understimulating and very fulfilling. But when we have a device in our hand that is beaming constant digital stimulation at our brain in a way that is sometimes more stimulating than the actual life that we are living, we suddenly become very willing to do absolutely nothing. And I'm sure I'm talking to a wide range of people today. I don't know exactly how much time you spend on your phone, but consider this. If a day is 24 hours long, in an ideal world, you're spending a third of that, eight hours of it, asleep. You're probably spending at least an additional eight hours managing your obligations, right? Either at work, at school, maintaining your home, taking care of kids, some kind, really probably more than eight, right? On a good day, most of us probably really have maybe like four hours that are not fully spoken for by obligations we've already signed up for. So let's say that you spend two hours a day on your phone doing just silly stuff that isn't harmful, but doesn't really add any value to your life. That it might seem like, well, that's only two hours of 24, right? That's not that much. But if that represents two out of four hours that of time when you actually basically could choose what you do, that's half your day. Functionally, that's half your day and half of your resources, half of the time you could be putting into you, you're instead putting into your phone. It's so hard to resist. And I know, let me tell you a little bit about how much of a difference two hours a day can make. Something else I want you to know about me, if you don't already know this, is I take my own advice. All of these things I'm telling you to do, these are either things I've implemented in previous years or things I'm implementing this year. I realized I had a problem with my phone like mid 2020. It was uh, it was right around COVID and I wasn't as busy at work. And I noticed that, um, you know, we were having like a lot of people call in and stuff who weren't comfortable being seen in person. So I had more free time at work than I was used to having. And I just noticed that I was doing absolutely nothing with it. And, and by nothing, I mean, I was on my phone a lot of the time. So in mid 2020, I decided to 
implement this change. And I try to only pick up my phone when I have a specific thing I need to do on it. Like, okay, I need to order protein powder. I'm going to pick up my phone, order protein powder, put it down. I need to call my mom, et cetera. But I don't just pick it up for no reason and like let the world just access me and show me what it thinks I'm into. Because that's just basically playing Russian roulette with your mental health. Since 2020, here are some of the things I've accomplished that I believe are 100% a direct result of limiting my screen time. In 2021, I released my first book for When Everything is Burning in May. Started writing it the day I put my screen time limit on. In the fall of 2021, I started my first intensive outpatient program for mental health, which was a huge game changer in the services that I'm able to offer in my area. In 2022, I built a home gym and got back into working out. And then in the second half of 2022, I started a second intensive outpatient program. In 2023, I started my YouTube channel, started my podcast, and opened my own practice. All of those things are what I did with the time I freed up from being on my phone. It, it, it's the biggest time drain there is, and that's where most of your time goes. So if you are feeling like, I know I should be doing all these things, I don't have time, my life is too busy, my life is too crammed full, try this strategy. Only pick up your phone for a specific reason, and when you finish that reason, put it down. Your entire world will open up. It's crazy. The second thing that I want you to try to do is don't buy anything you don't need. We are so wrapped up in this consumerist culture where we're constantly just adding crap to our lives. And you might wonder, okay, I can see the value of that financially, but how does that give me more time? Well, first of all, shopping takes time. And a lot of times we're shopping for just crap. Like, again, it's kind of like the phone thing. Like we don't even need something. It's just like, we just get on Amazon and we start to browse. Browsing is a terrible idea for shopping because if you start and you don't have a specific thing in mind that you want, essentially what you're doing is you're looking at things to try to find something that you didn't previously know existed, that when you find out it exists, you will want. And when you find out that it exists and you want it, you have created a void between yourself and your own happiness that you can only fill by spending money on the thing that you didn't care about before you even knew it existed. You are basically then creating a problem and you can only solve that problem with money. And in addition to the time you spend shopping, Everything that comes into your house becomes a responsibility and you have two choices. You can either take really good care of your stuff and keep it neatly organized and maintain it, which takes a lot of time, or you cannot do those things, which means your house gets really cluttered and disorganized and stresses you out. And then you have to do those days where you like do the crazy deep clean. And that takes a lot of time too. So much of our time gets spent on stuff that we don't need. I don't even care about the money. I'm sure that people listening to this right now have a wide range of financial situations. Some of you are probably fine buying a bunch of crap you don't need, and it's not going to really affect your ability to be financially independent. Cool, but it's still a waste. It still wastes time. It wastes energy. It wastes, it wastes space in your home. There are so many more important things you could be doing with your time and energy than just trying to look for crap that, you don't, that you're not going to end up caring about. It's like... You end up being like a dog chasing a ball, right? Like, you know, when you have, if you have like two balls and you throw one for a dog and the dog will chase it with everything he has, but if, you, if he catches it, which he was working so hard on, and then you throw that second ball, he forgets about the ball he just caught because now he has to go chase this one. Don't be that dog. Don't let consumerist culture dictate your life, and steal your energy. Mm -hmm. You need that time for much more important endeavors than that. The third thing I want you to consider trying is limit yourself to one caffeinated beverage per day within the first four hours of your day. And that one might seem odd at first, right? If we're talking about having more energy, I'm going to decrease my caffeine intake when caffeine is a stimulant that gives me energy. Two reasons for that. Reason number one, it is not correct to say that stimulants give you energy. They borrow energy because they do increase your available energy while you're under the influence of the stimulant. But there's a refractory period that comes later where your energy will be below what it typically is. And that's typically when we consume another caffeinated beverage or a third because we're trying to avoid that crash. You can avoid the crash forever. It's inevitable. And the more you build up to it, the longer you delay it, the harder it hits you when it finally arrives. 
Also, and perhaps even more importantly, caffeine dramatically affects your sleep. Even if it does not affect your ability to fall asleep or stay asleep, it will massively reduce your sleep quality. And even if you get a decent amount of sleep, you will function as if you've gotten far less than you actually did. Caffeine has a half-life of eight hours and a quarter life of 12 hours, which means I'm, I'm stealing this from Matthew Walker. A lot of you guys have probably heard this before. I'm not clever enough to make this up. But what that means is if you drink a full cup of coffee at noon and you're going to go to bed at midnight, that's functionally the same as if you had a quarter cup of coffee on your nightstand. And as you're getting into bed, you drank that quarter cup of coffee. You wouldn't do that, right? But functionally, it's the same thing because that's how much of that coffee, that's how much of that caffeine still remains in your bloodstream 12 hours later. So try to limit it to just one so you're not on the crazy up and down energy roller coaster all day long and try to make it early in the day so that it does not compromise your ability to get good high quality sleep and fall asleep quickly. The fourth thing I want you to do to gain more time and energy in your day is to try to eat three meals a day. Try to really get breakfast, lunch, and dinner in. All food that you eat eventually gets converted to glucose or blood sugar. When we skip meals or just eat snacks and call them meals, we end up in this like really low energy state for a while. And then we typically eat one big meal and that spikes it. So it's kind of similar to the caffeine problem where our energy level all day long becomes very unpredictable and we get these slow, sluggish, confused, foggy, lethargic periods. One of the best ways to avoid that is to keep your mind properly supplied with caloric energy all day long. And a meal, a really good sized, you know, appropriate, complete meal will last about five or six hours in your bloodstream. So if you eat three meals a day, three meals a day, excuse me, spaced about five or six hours apart, you should be functioning optimally from a caloric energy input perspective. The fifth thing that I want you to consider doing is limit yourself to a maximum of one alcoholic beverage per week. Similar logic to caffeine here. Alcohol, obviously, when you're drinking, even if you just have one drink, you're not quite on your A game, right? It's something that takes time. It's something that takes energy. And it's also going to negatively affect your sleep quality in a way that's really similar to caffeine. So if you want to have more time and more energy, try not to spend much of it, if any, on alcohol because it's not something that pays you back at all. It gives you an acute temporary, pleasant experience, and then it's over and you're left feeling drained and not hundred percent. If you're, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've been struggling with your mental health and you want to optimize it and you want to get better, we can't afford these drains. We can't afford to have these essentially useless expenditures, right? I, I, I hear so many people say like, I feel I'm, I'm so caught. I'm so trapped between this rock and a hard place because my life is so busy and I have all these responsibilities and I have all these obligations. When am I supposed to fit in you know, managing my mental health or managing my physical health for that matter, it takes so much time. It takes so much energy. Am I supposed to not spend time with my family? Am I supposed to not work? No, you're supposed to stop doing the things that don't actually give you anything. I neglected to mention that before when I was talking about the phone, but all these things I've done, and I'm not trying to brag. My whole point is you can do this too, or you can do your version of this anyway. All the things I've done in the past three years, I have not taken time away from work to do those things. In fact, I've gotten busier at work. Like my nine to five is more like an eight to five thirty these days. I, I'm actually going to try to work on that this year, but that's tangent successfully avoided. Um, not only that, but it's I, I didn't take time away from my family either. I cut out stuff that didn't really give me anything in return other than that moment. I cut out things that had no long-term value. So you can add things to your life without sacrificing, you know, the time you need to put in for work or school or, or your other responsibilities without sacrificing family time. I, I guarantee if you're being really 100% honest with yourself, your entire day is not going to those things. There are these little black holes that just suck time away from you. And what I said today maybe wasn't an exhaust, exhaustive list but it, it would get you a good ways there. So if you actually implement some or all of the five ideas I just gave you, you're going to sudden, maybe, maybe within a few days, it might take, there might be a short adjustment period, but you're going to find that you suddenly have way more time and way more energy than you are used to having. For the first time in a long time, you are going to experience a surplus. You're going to have leftover time and energy. You're going to get to the end of your day and you're going to be like, I am not completely exhausted. I have gas left in the tank. This is crazy. This is an amazing feeling. 
what should I do with it? That's where the second set of ideas comes in. We're going to use that extra time and energy that you have freed up from the things you've stopped doing, and we're going to invest it into things that will further improve your mental health. The first thing I would recommend that you consider doing is working in some kind of stretching or mobility work. Five or 10 minutes a day tops. This does not have to be a big time expenditure. So much, there is so much overlap between depression and anxiety, probably all mental health conditions really, and the state of your body. And that includes things like tension, chronic pain, ability to move and function and do things in the world with comfort and without pain or without mobility issues. It is uncomfortable to live in a body that doesn't work right, doesn't feel right, doesn't move right, hurts all the time. And there are a few things that are more depressing than hurting all the time. I know because I've had some good, minor, minor, I'll be honest about that, but I've had some chronic pain issues and it's absolutely miserable. Like it makes you hate every second of every day. And will five to 10 minutes of stretching and mobility work cure that? Not necessarily. It could. It really depends on the severity of the problem you're facing. But I do know that if your body moves and functions more efficiently, more pain-free, if you have a wider range of motion, the entire world and your existence in it becomes more enjoyable. And it doesn't feel like you're trapped inside this like rotting, rusty prison. I know that was really, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of visceral. I guess I'm just talking about my own body right now. That's how I felt about it at times. And this is something that's really, really helped me. So I hope that it will help you as well. Branching off that, the second thing I want you to consider adding is doing some kind of regular prescribed physical activity in addition to the mobility or stretching three to five days a week, maybe 20 or 30 minutes a day. And you don't even have to start there. I made a whole video on how to work up to effective levels of physical activity for your mental health. You don't have to start there. This can be the long-term goal, but it is almost impossible. And the only reason I say almost is because I try to never speak in absolutes. It is almost impossible to enjoy good mental health without some form of regular physical activity. Our brains just do not work right without it. It is as essential as sleeping and eating. Like it really is. It's up there with our top tier needs as human beings. Once upon a time, we lived lives where this stuff was built in, where to, to continue to live, you had to be physically active. We no longer have that. Most of us, do. some of us have physically, if you have a physical job, you probably don't need to worry about this. Okay. But if you're like me and you have a very sedentary job, then you need to add this in because you're not getting it from work. We're built to work physically. And if your job really doesn't require you to work physically, unfortunately, you do need to add that in somewhere else or you're gonna suffer the consequences physically and mentally. Now, the good news is your brain doesn't really care what type of physical activity this is. If you like cardio, do cardio. If you like weight training, do weight training. If you like sports, do sports. If you like swimming, do swimming. You get the point, right? It, it doesn't matter. Your body just needs to move. And the mental health benefits to regularly making your body move are up there with like top of the line antidepressants and the best therapist you could ever find. I know it's kind of a meme, like oh, I'll just go to the gym instead of, but, but I'm not saying instead of. Go to the gym in addition to doing all the things that you do for your mental health. And it doesn't have to be the gym. The, you know, gym is like a, a catch all term here. Your gym could be your garage. Your gym could be the street in front of your yard. Like your gym can be your bedroom. I mean, we live in the era of YouTube. You can find free full-length bodyweight workouts on YouTube. Great ones, like ones that would be better than what you'd pay for 20 years ago. Everybody can do something. I know some of you have some physical limitations. Work with those physical limitations. Find something you can do to get your body moving. It will make so much of a difference, I promise you. Here's something else. Now, a lot of these have been have been laborious, right? These are these are a lot of demanding work type things that I've suggested doing so far. Here's one that might be a little bit more fun and fall a little bit more into like a typical definition of self-care. If, if you're single, try to plan something special for yourself once a week. If you have a significant other, try to plan a special date once a week. And if you have a family, try to plan a special family outing once a week. One of the worst things for our mental health is repetition. 
Now we, you know, we, there's, there's no way to not have a repetitive life. Everyone's life is kind of mundane, right? But when you get into that grind mentality where just every day runs together and there's no differentiation between any of them and you're looking forward, like when is the next day that's going to feel like I have a life? When is the next day where something special is going to happen? And you look forward into the future and you can't find that day. You don't see one coming. There are a few things more depressing than that to think like, I don't know when this is going to end. I don't know when I'm not just going to wake up and wonder what day it is because they all feel the exact same shade of gray. If you can plan one, and, and, and this doesn't have to be a big financial expenditure either. I mean, this could be like going for a walk. You could double up on this one. You can make this your workout too. Going for a walk on a new nature trail you've never been to. Going to an art museum. Trying a new restaurant. I, again, I know a lot of you face financial limitations. This doesn't have to be expensive. This doesn't have to cost you a dime. All I'm saying is do something that you don't do every day already that is somewhat enjoyable for you. It's so easy for us to just neglect the joyful, pleasurable parts of life and just focus on what we have to do. I am certainly probably more guilty of that than the average person. And that's why this is a new one for me. This is this is a 2024 new endeavor for me. Um, try to plan something. For me, it's with my family. So I'm looking for family-friendly stuff. But do it. I think this one's the hardest for single people because you feel like, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it just for me. Why? Why not? You are no less important than any other human being. You deserve to enjoy your life. You deserve to do fun, special things. And if you're single, maybe no one's planning it for you. So you do it. You be the one who says, you know what, self? We're going to go see a waterfall today. I haven't seen a waterfall in a long time. I'd really like to see a waterfall today. Be that person for yourself. Show up for yourself that way. It will, if you plan something special every day, every week, I'm sorry, you're never going to go more than six days without something kind of cool in your life happening. I mean, don't underestimate how much of a difference that can make. When we have something to look forward to, even if it's little, you know, who, who I don't know who's the judge of that. It can make such a difference, such a difference. So please think about implementing that. Something else I want you to try to implement, try to read one nonfiction book per month, right? So that'd be 12 books a year. I believe that it is very difficult to enjoy. Like in, in addition to always needing to have something to look forward to, I also think that it's really difficult to enjoy life without some tangible sense of progress. And a lot of the really big picture things we're working on, again, you know, career, education, family, there's like these big markers, you know, like your kid graduating high school or you getting a promotion that happen very infrequently, right? Like you'll, you can go years between having these big, like, Hey, you did a good job on something recognition periods, basically. So these are all like long games and they don't give you a really tangible sense of progress in these long in-between phases. I think we all need that. When you build up your skills on things that are of uh, that on things that are of interest to you or things that matter to you, it can make such a difference in your life. When I look back on what I would consider to be like the best periods of time in my life, where I was like, that was a better than average, you know, few months or whatever it was. One thing I've noticed that they almost all have in common is that I had some sort of endeavor. Like I had a, a new skill or a project I was working on, or, or I just discovered something I was really passionate about and I was learning more about it, trying it out. And I was excited. And then there's these periods of time where I tend to just stagnate. And again, kind of just get into these really samey routine patterns. And I don't really get a sense that I am growing or developing as a person. Those periods of time are very depressing for me. I, this is at least me. I need a sense of progress. Like if my life is a is a video game, I need it to be like an RPG where I'm leveling up and I need to see these numbers going up or else I feel like, well, what am, what's the point? What am I doing? Like, where am I going with any of this? So nonfiction books, I think, are a great way to learn more about things that matter to you. Maybe you want to know more about finance, fitness, business, you know, uh, relationships, spirituality, history, geography, just pick something and learn about it. I, I, our brains need that. Our brains need stimulation. And when we... When we've been doing the same things for a long period of time, it becomes very understimulating because we automate things and then we don't really have to consciously engage with them. And then life just gets so blah. 
And I also want you to try, I don't know what number I'm on, by the way, I, I was attempting to number these, but it's that moment has passed like long ago. Try to, at the end of every day, take five minutes to just do a quick victory journal. What I mean by victory journal is write down all the good stuff you did that day. And, and if, if you thought, well, what about the days when I don't do anything good? They don't exist. They do not exist. If you look at your life with a fine enough to a, fi <laughs> a fine enough toothed comb, I, that's, I know it's not the right way to say it, but I, I know you understand what I'm, what I mean. You'll find stuff. Here's my rule of thumb. If it would be a failure, if you didn't do it or didn't do it correctly, then it is a success if you do it. And if you look at it from that lens, you will not even be able to limit yourself to five. It would take you hours to journal your entire day. Think about it like this. Like if you fail to stop at a red light and you hit the car in front of you, you wouldn't be real happy with yourself, right? You call that like probably stupid or, or a failure or something like that. So then every time you do stop at a red light, you've succeeded. You have successfully avoided an accident. That's actually a big deal. We don't really give ourselves credit for that because we do it. Again, it goes back to that routine, mundane, not stimulating pattern. You do it every day, many, many times per day in most cases. So your brain stops recognizing it as special. When you were first learning to drive and didn't trust your ability to do that, you probably did. Every time you stopped, you're like, oh man, I didn't know if I was going to make it that time. But you're used to it now, so it doesn't feel special anymore. You've become jaded to your own driving abilities. But that doesn't mean that it's not important. Every little thing you do, every meal you eat, every time you go to bed, every physical activity, like I don't even mean just stuff on this. I mean little stuff. I smiled at my kid. I hugged my son. I taught my daughter something. I went for a walk. I drove. I put gas in my car. There was a time, I've told you guys this before, there was a time when I was so anxious, I was too scared to put gas in my car. I'd like give my friends money and be like, Oh, I got to go to the bathroom. Do you mind? Like I would find ways to not do it because it, it was too hard. It stressed me out too much. And I still think about that. Every time I put gas in my car, I'm like, man, glad I can do this now. Cause there was a time when I couldn't everything that you do, even if there's not a time when you personally have been un unable to do it, someone somewhere is struggling with it. So try to notice and, and really acknowledge every victory that you achieve and take a few minutes to reflect on it at the end of the day. Because otherwise what your brain is going to do is it's going to do the anti-highlight reel thing at the end of the day. It's going to be like, hey, right as you're trying to fall asleep, probably. Hey, I don't know why this is my brain voice. Remember all the dumb stuff you did today? Let's think about that now, right, right now, right before you go to bed. Let's think about everything you screwed up. This is a great way to counter it. That's why I want you to do it at the end of the day, because that's when your brain likes to ruminate and throw all the negative crap at you. So counter it by saying, well, yeah, yeah, those things did happen. Sure. But like, what about all this? That's pretty good, right? I got a pretty good day. Now, third section goes back to forgetting, because hopefully if you're still watching this, you're like, man, these are some good ideas. I really want to try to implement these. And you're feeling like excited and motivated. And that feeling will last some amount of time after you turn this video off, not forever, unless you keep watching it again and again and again. So if you really want to commit to some of these, here's what I'd recommend that you do. And I am doing this. I'll, I'll show you at the end of this video. For things that you're going to be doing at the same time of day, like consistently, like meals, for example, maybe, or maybe you're going to work out at the same time every day, put them in your calendar. Put them as a recurring appointment in your calendar and set your phone up to notify you. Do not leave this to your brain because unless your brain is much, much, much exponentially more powerful than mine, you can have the best of intentions and they will be thwarted by forgetfulness because you're going to be like, oh, I just, I just didn't think about that because I'm not in the habit of doing it. You have to build these things as habits. You can eventually get to the point where you don't have to plan them, where you don't have to schedule them, where you don't have to think about them. But the way that you get to that point is by doing them consistently. And the best way to do them consistently is to make sure you don't forget. So things that can be scheduled, put them into a calendar, make them recurring, and make sure that your phone tells you when you should be doing them. For things that are harder to schedule, things that are harder to quantify, but they're just like, like the phone thing, general lifestyle changes that you want to commit to, get some kind of notes app on your phone, write them in there and look at it every single morning. Like first thing you do, pull up this app and review, what am I trying to do? Because that way you're less likely to forget. If you can't remember to pull up the app, 
then screenshot your list, make it your lock screen or make it your background on your phone so that you cannot go very long in your day without remembering, here are the things that I think will help this be the best mental health year that I've had in the while. That's the goal. Basically what all this comes down to is remember that you are constantly writing your own autobiography, right? That That's really what life is. And so all these maybe seemingly small variables that we're talking about today, all these relatively little decisions, they have a tremendous cumulative impact because in addition to the actual, you know, mental health and physiological changes they, they create, possibly the most powerful change they create is one that's really hard to quantify, but it's that they change your sense of self. They change who you see when you look in the mirror, not just physically. Some of them do change what you'll see physically, but that's, that's not necessarily the point. When I look at myself now, like I can see myself in my computer screen right now, and I see somebody who is capable of doing hard things, that's not always what I saw when I looked in the mirror. In fact, at one point, I would have told you when I looked in the mirror, I see the least capable, I wouldn't have even said man because I wasn't an adult, but like I see the least capable person I've ever met. I see someone who avoids every challenge even little ones. I see someone who wants nothing more out of life than to sit in his room and play video games and waste away because that's all he thinks he can do. He does want more than that, but he's not even willing to acknowledge it to himself because he's terrified he won't be able to do it because he doesn't think he's good enough. That's who I used to think I was. And at that time, I wasn't necessarily wrong. But by making changes like these in my life, I have changed my identity in my own eyes. I have earned my own respect. And I think that is I think that's the person whose respect it is hardest to earn because we typically are harder on ourselves than any other human would be. If you can earn your own respect, that is a mentality shift. That is a feeling that makes its home inside you that changes every second of your life. So whether you do my entire list, part of my list, discard my own list, but make your own list, I hope that 2024 is the year with some of these strategies that you set and achieve goals that you never thought possible and that you earn your own respect. And because of that, have the best mental health year you've had in a long time, maybe ever. Take care and I'll see you next time.